G'day folks, welcome to our second last optics lecture and the second last lecture for PHS 2062. Today we're going to uh, take our formalism for polarization to the next level by introducing these things called Jones vectors and uh, do what's called the Jones calculus. Uh, unsurprisingly, this is going to be an exercise in applying linear algebra uh, in a new way. We've already done it twice. We're going to be applying it to the, uh, the case of polarization. So a review from where we got to last time, uh, we returned to the vector nature of light. After solving the scalar wave equation, we admitted that light is a wave which has a vector orientation, and we found that the wave vector k, the electric field, and the magnetic field make an orthogonal right-handed coordinate system. We also then just said, well, let's just choose a direction for the wave, and we'll, we'll just always call that z. And that made life a lot easier. It turned out that all we had to do then was consider two orthogonal field components, ex and ey. And we went from six components for the electromagnetic field, ex, ey, ez, bx, by, and bz, and we whittled them down to two components, ex and ey. Well, why is that? The first reason is that light's a transverse wave, so we don't need to consider any component along, uh, of the electric field along z, because it's vanishing. And also, once we know the electric field for light, one of the Maxwell equations told us the magnetic, once we know the electric field, one of the Maxwell's equations told us the magnetic field. So this is great. We have just two independent components of the polarization vector, and this is how we're going to parameterize it. We have some um, spatial dependence in Z, some time dependence in T, and we can write out the uh, Cartesian expansion of this vector with X and Y unit vectors there. For plane waves, we said we can write down how these things evolve in space and time. And remember, we were working towards a classification scheme that begged us to look at the dials of these equations. What are the dials? Recall that k and omega are fixed. They're the constants of the monochromacity of light. The, weight, the modulus of the wave vector is 2 pi on lambda. Uh, omega is related to the speed of light and k, and uh, those are fixed constants. Z and T were just spatiotemporal coordinates. So they're not really dials as such. They're just um, the coordinates you plug in when you want to look at the light in a certain place or at a certain time. The remaining dials of these equations were these three numbers here, E naught X, E naught Y, and the relative phase between the two orthogonal components, epsilon. And we found out that the state of polarization was indeed dictated by how this uh, curve was uh, traced out by the tip of the electric field vector. So we just make a parametric plot of the electric field vector and say, what kind of shape is its, is its tip drawing out? And we have these remaining variables. So um, I wanted to really remind you that this is an exercise in, um, in parametric graph drawing. And we're going to do so with, um, with an example of circularly polarized light, because this one's a little vexed. Remember that when we specify the polarization, especially its handedness, we've got to be really careful. We have to say whether we're um, looking at a fixed point in space or a fixed point in time, and whether the wave is coming towards us or going away from us. Of course, that really depends on whether we're going to call that rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise. For our convention, we're always going to sit in a plane of constant z, and we're going to vary time with the light coming towards us. So I'll sit where you guys are sitting. The light's coming towards us. We're sitting in this plane, and we're just watching what shape the electric field draws. I also talked about this idea of um, grabbing the helix. This is just one way to specify right-handed circular polarization. Um, it turns out that for clockwise rotation of the electric field as a function of time, this actually gave you a, a right-handed helix when you plot it as a function of space at a fixed time. And you can um, sort of reconcile this seemingly contradictory convention when you look at how the phase evolves. The phase increases for increasing z, and it decreases for decreasing z. So let's um, actually plot this in Mathematica and just remind ourselves uh, how, how to actually do this with parametric graphs. So I'm going to make a, um, a function called evec, and uh, it's going to depend on uh, space, time, those three very important parameters, and the constants, which I'll define as constants uh, just by making them 2 pi. That, that's kind of like what we call natural units. It makes the maths very simple. So what's this going to look like? It's going to be a two vector, and it's going to be E naught cosine of kz minus omega t. And the y component's going to look really similar, but its amplitude will be different. It's going to be E naught y. And it's going to have some extra phase, epsilon. 
So this animal is a, a powerful uh, function that we can now use to plot. And the way I'm going to plot this is with a parametric plot. So I need to um, basically to specify which parameter I'm going to vary. And because we're sitting at a constant position in space, I may as well just choose z equals zero. I'm going to vary t. I'm going to make e naught x and e naught y the same because we're going to look at the example of circular polarization. And for the first case, let's just look at um, uh, negative pi on two, which was the right-handed convention. Just to check that what I'm plotting is meaningful, it's always good to just evaluate your test function and make sure that um, it's giving you what you want, particularly when it doesn't, because here I still have, aha, I didn't put a space between k and z, which is why they're blue, and omega and t. Juxtaposition with a space in Mathematica is multiplication, but concatenating strings, Mathematica just thinks that's one variable. Great. So now I've got uh, something that depends only on time, which tells me I'm allowed to plot it on a parametric plot. You'll see that I've lost the z dependence and all those constants have been put in and the dials have been specified as well. So let's now do a parametric plot of this and we're going to make t go from 0 to 1. It's a circle. Great. Um, that's not very illuminating. What we really want to do is see how it evolves. So I'm going to make the plot range uh, go from minus 1 to 1 because whenever we're animating something, we should keep these bounds fixed. And I also need to only go up to a certain final time, t. So I'm going to wrap this in an animate now, animate, and vary this final time, t. This t will start at something small, so I don't break the parametric plot. Let's make it 0, 0, 1, and it's going to go up to 1. All right. And indeed, if this is to be considered as the tip of the electric field vector, it's making a clockwise rotation um, as a function of time. And you can see that also from the way that um, this electric field was expanded uh, for the particular case we had. Still not super um, illuminating in terms of a vector, but it's really easy to draw this vector on the graph by using an epilogue. If I put it into the um, end of the plot call, all I have to do is draw an arrow. And I don't know what the call signature for arrow is, so I'll just press shift control K and I'll get um, the call signature for me. It's going to go from 0, 0. And the tip is going to be the exact value that we um, specified before. It's going to be evec of 0t11 negative pi on 2. So hopefully that will give us this arrow. Yes, it does, um, as the electric field evolves in time. Great. That's the right-handed uh, circular polarization example. To check that our convention makes sense and that our code makes sense, let's just look at another case where we have a relative phase of positive pi on 2. In that case, the sign of the y component changes. And if I change this, uh, I'll also get now a left-handed uh, going arrow. Uh, left-handed only in the sense that this is how we specify polarization in this way. We said this is an anti-clockwise rotation for left-handed. Not left-handed in terms of a rotation in a right-handed coordinate system. So again, you never get away from uh, some discomfort of how you define polarization conventions. But we're just going to say, if you fix space, vary time, anti-clockwise rotations are left-handed circular and clockwise rotations are right-handed circular. Any questions about this somewhat perplexing convention? Good. All right, so the relative amplitude and phase of the orthogonal field components dictate this classification scheme. However, if we just do the dumbest thing possible, which is to set e naught x equal to e naught y, in other words, make the relative amplitude 1 and vary just one of those dials, the relative phase epsilon, this is what we get. We get this beautiful uh, gamut of all polarization states and you can see that they have all different ellipticities. There's linear, some uh, stretched out ellipse, circular, left-handed, um, so on and so forth. We get all the shapes, we get all the kind of uh, stretchinesses of the ellipse, but we don't get all pure polarization states because I could have vertical or horizontal uh, linear, and this ellipse could be rotated as well. So we say that we get this up to a rotation about the, um, the z-axis. I've said this is all pure polarization states up to a rotation. And what do I mean by pure? Well, relationship status, it's complicated. To really understand what pure polarization is, you need to do um, quantum optics and um, quantum statistics. Hecht kind of makes a bit of a hand wave about this in terms of incoherent emitters. I don't really want to talk about light atom interactions here. And I also don't want to um, uh, give you the impression that you have to start studying polarization 
with this impure state which we make pure. I'm just going to take for granted that we start off with pure polarization states and manipulate them. What about the intensity? Well, it turns out that um, you, know, you change the intensity of light, its polarization state doesn't change. Intensity, albeit very important, is not going to be part of our scheme for classifying polarization. One more note on taxonomy. These are all strictly ellipses. Straight lines are just a particular type of ellipse. Um, circles are also a particular type of ellipse. A circle is just an ellipse whose major axis is the same length as its minor axis. Uh, but we generally kind of use this notion of thinking of elliptical polarization as neither linear nor circular. And that's just a convention. But these are strictly all different types of ellipses. The other question you might have had after lecture nine was, how does the handedness change in this picture? Look at this case of going from linear through to left-handed circular, through to linear again, and right-handed circular. Something interesting happens right about here um, when we go from left-handed to right-handed. It's not obvious what that is, um, but the code we just wrote in Mathematica will help us um, figure it out. You can use the interactive polarization demo on Moodle, but let's just add a dial to this um, simulation and check it out for ourselves. So now I'm going to replace this pi on 2 with that dial epsilon. And I'm going to do something a little um, dangerous. I'm going to wrap a an animate in a manipulate. Ooh, yes, I love the suspense. Okay, so now this uh, is going to depend on epsilon, and we might want to make epsilon go from 0 to 2 pi, but I don't like thinking in, or typing in radians, so I'm going to specify epsilon in degrees instead. Okay, so this is going to go from 0 to 360 in that beautiful diagram from Hecht. Okay, so we have time is always evolving as part of our animation. And we're starting off with this linear state, zero relative phase between two orthogonal components. And now we're going to introduce some non-zero uh, relative phase. And straight away, we get a left-handed elliptical polarization state. Let's keep going. It's getting more circular all the way up to, uh, let's go to 90 just for good measure, right there. This is the left-handed circular state we looked at before. So we're not quite at this inflection point of going from left-handed to right-handed. But as I increase this again, I'll get to this critical point. This is the last left-handed elliptical polarization we'll see. Then it's linear, and now it's right-handed. So it's a little bit trippy, um, but that's how this polarization parameterization evolves from left-handed. That's exactly right. Yes, that's right. And we have um, this whole diagram repeats modulo 2 pi. So plotting this from 0 to 360 degrees is enough. And now we'll do something really cool, which is just to um, animate both these dials. And we'll get something a little bit trippy um, and psychedelic, which doesn't really convey the physics that well until I really speed up the, um, the evolution in time. So I'll make this go really fast. And that one too. You could get a headache or um, some excitement by watching that all day. All right. You want it in 3D? Check Moodle. So there's this, um, this orientation of the ellipse as well, which for those uh, diagrams I showed you above is always either positive 45 degrees or negative 45 degrees in this really simple case where we set E naught X equal to E naught Y and only vary epsilon. In general, though, the elliptical axis will be are oriented at some angle uh, alpha from the x-axis, and we can figure this out using this um, equation here. This equation involves taking an arctan of this expression, and notice that this expression depends on what it should depend on, which is the three dials that classify polarization, E naught x, E naught y, and epsilon. So for any, if you know these things, the relative amplitude and relative phase of the orthogonal components, you can figure out the orientation of an ellipse, and this is a, one of the questions in the final optics tutorial. It's time for our, our daily PSA, or physics symbiosis announcement. So we're going to return to a, a matrix representation of something now, and this kind of wraps up beautifully the way we've done this several times throughout the course. We're going to try and find a concise way of representing arbitrary polarization states that's amenable to all the great things we know about linear algebra, linear, tra linear transformations, addition, and so on and so forth. This state vector description has permeated this unit, but it's also um, very common to many other fields. 
The one that I use in my daily work is that of spins in magnetic fields. Quantum mechanics is uh, rife with examples of linear algebra, and we man manipulate spin states with magnetic fields in a way that's perfectly described by taking state vectors and acting on them with matrices. It's also the case of um, neutrinos passing through the Earth and us right now. C neutrinos are comprised of three mass eigenstates, and as they evolve through planet Earth, they oscillate between different admixtures of those eigenstates. This process itself is, is fantastically modelled by matrix mechanics and state vectors. But it's not just physics where we see this um, precept. It's also when we're modelling things like climate, traffic, and how a virus might spread through a population. So it's very common to solving uh, simple and complicated equations in all walks of life. And PSA. So the way we're going to do this for um, polarization is to take this trigonometric representation of real electric field components, and unsurprisingly, we're going to use this um, complex representation, an abstract way of bundling up those three numbers uh, that helps us do the math. In doing so, we're going to do um, something that Jacob pointed out on the forums, which is take out a common phase of, um, of phi, the spatial temporal dependent phase, because it's only the relative phase that matters. So we're going to say that um, we're going to define a Jones vector like this, E with a tilde on top. The tilde just reminds us that it's not a real vector in R2. It's a vector in complex space, so we need to weigh a way of distinguishing this, and the tilde is how we do it. And it's got three numbers in it, E naught X, E naught Y, and epsilon, constructed in such a way that it will make a good mathematical representation of our polarization states. So three real numbers are put into this form. That's a Jones vector. Let's take a look at an example. So for circular polarization, um, we're going to write out the real representation, which we've had a few goes at already, and we're then going to sort of figure out what its Jones vector is using this equivalence. So remember that EX, or E of Z and T, for the case of circular polarization, there's a common factor E0 out the front. The amplitude of the X and Y components are equal for circular polarization. There was a cosine of phi times unit vector X and a sine of phi for the unit vector Y. And this phi was just the spatiotemporal phase. All right, let's get this into a form that's going to be closer to um, the complex representation, which is to express both the X and Y components with a cosine. This is actually just going backwards because we're going to end up with the relative phase being very transparent to us. I'll actually consider both left and right-handed, so I'll make this a plus and minus up here. And uh, if you haven't Netflixed and chill with the unit circle for a while, um, you should, because I'm going to tell you that this is um, cosine of phi minus a plus pi on 2, which by now you should be great friends with. All right. Now that I've got it in a sum of two cosines, I can write it as the real part of something, a real part of a complex vector. So that's going to be um, the real part of e to the i phi times the unit vector x plus e to the i phi minus or plus pi on 2 unit vector y. All right. This is literally um, where we can start to make the um, complex representation. And I'm going to do it by just um, defining this thing in here as the Jones vector. So this is equivalent to uh, what we are going to call the Jones vector, which is equal to E naught outside of, I'm going to write it as a column vector now. And E to the power of minus or plus I pi on 2 is just... 1 minus or plus i. So this is um, what we're going to call the Jones vector for um, circular polarization. Um, I'm going to be a bit hypocritical now and, and say that um, I can often not only ignore the relative phase or the global phase e to the i phi at the front, but we often drop the amplitude as well. Now I've been telling you all year that everything has units, including the number of elephants in this room, uh, this is always true, except when it's not, and um, except when we're specifying Jones vectors. 
So occasionally, we'll drop the E0 or the overall electric field amplitude from the Jones vector. And here's an example of what I'm going to um, uh, try to indulge uh, if you indulge me with this hypocrisy. So let's look at the Jones vector for right-handed circular polarization. It's equal to 1 negative i. And the Jones vector for uh, left-handed circular, so just as a reminder, that's right-handed circular. And this is left-handed circular. It's 1 plus i. It's perfectly legit that I've dropped the e to the i phi. That doesn't matter. But I've also dropped the e naught, which is a little bit sketchy. But it's got to do with the fact that uh, polarization classification doesn't depend on intensity. Let's look what happens when I add two of these together. Remember in ray optics, when we asked this pretty weird question in the tutorial, do ray vectors form a vector space? We can ask the same question for Jones vectors. And I'm going to do so by adding together left-handed circular and right-handed circular. And you should pretty much um, not see this as any surprise now. I'm going to get 2, 0. Uh, what is this? This is 2 times 1, 0, which is the Jones vector, or 2 times the Jones vector for horizontally polarized light. So it's linear and horizontal uh, polarization. It turns out that this is a really great way to form a vector space. We have this construction which allows us to have complex vectors, complex two vectors that are closed under addition. Um, they, make, they take two animals, two polarizations, and make a perfectly reasonable other animal when you add them together. So unlike ray vectors, Jones vectors do form a, um, a uh, closed vector space. So um, I showed you an example where I took uh, left-handed circular and right-handed circular and made um, horizontal polarization. I want you to have a think about how I'd make vertical polarization. So um, go ahead and pull your phones out and have a go at this question. Sorry? I will draw it on this slide. Whoa. Maybe I won't. Sorry, I can't go back once the poll started, but have a go at this anyway. So we're 50-50 at the moment. Think about um, the subtraction. If that were the case, which other answers might be correct? So by deduction or otherwise, some of the logicistas in the audience are now um, eliciting some groupthink. And um, yeah, it, it is indeed B and or C. For starters, um, if it's B, then it has to be C as well, because adding things together with a phase shift to pi is just subtracting them. E to the i pi is negative 1, Feynman's favorite equation. Um, so really, it's a choice between D and A. And um, I can show it pretty readily. In fact, I'll just skip to my, um, a slide I prepared earlier, that this is indeed a, a way to add two opposite-handed polarizations together and get vertical polarization. So uh, in this example, I just add an e to the i pi there, and this becomes a minus sign. And the only remaining component is that along the vertical direction. So that's, um, that's the example for vertical polarization. The other precepts of uh, linear algebra that we want to check are orthogonality. It's not just um, addition being closed that forms a vector space. We want to ask what happens when we take two Jones vectors and um, take their dot product. Remember, though, that because these are complex vectors, the dot product is a little special. It's the same as the dot product we use in quantum mechanics, which is we take um, vector E1 with, and we dot it with the conjugate of Jones vector uh, E2, the complex conjugate. And we define or we propose that this is a condition for orthogonality. Two polarization states will be deemed orthogonal if they're satisfied this equation. So um, again, we can check with um, an example here. And we're going to check the first case of um, linear polarizations. This one's pretty straightforward. So let's um, look at 
the case of horizontal polarization. That is a tilde, as per my previous comment. And the vertical state is just 0, 1. Uh, taking the conjugate of um, E vertical is the same as E vertical. So this is really uh, straight, straightforward. This just reduces to 1, 0, dotted with 0, 1, which is 1 times 0 plus 0 times 1 equals 0. That's good. What about circular polarizations? We would probably think that left-handed is, is orthogonal to right-handed, and you'd be correct in assuming this. Let's check. 1 minus i for right-handed circular, and uh, 1 plus i for left-handed circular. Now when we take this dot product, we have to be careful with conjugation. And I'm going to get 1 negative i dotted with 1 negative i. This is 1 squared plus minus i squared, which is 1 squared plus i squared, which is 1 minus 1 equals 0. Good. These are just uh, sanity checks that confirm our definition is mathematically sound. Um, we should be producing these results because physically they make perfect sense. We can also find um, any arbitrary, take any arbitrary polarization state and find a different one, B, that is orthogonal to it. So if we have some A given by um, complex number AX and AY, there will be some B that is orthogonal to this. So actually there's an um, exercise in the notes where you're asked to find the Jones vector that's orthogonal to um, 2 and I. Uh, let's have a go at this uh, right now. So our job is to find this B. Um, because we're trying to find B, this equation of A dot B star equals zero is a little annoying, but because A dot B star equals zero, we can just take the conjugate of the whole thing. and find that uh, A star dot B equals zero as well. This makes the math easier, and I'm going to um, parameterize the Jones vector B with some unknowns, the unknowns that we're trying to find. Uh, the top component is allowed to be real, because we're always allowed to um, specify it um, with a, just a relative phase between the two orthogonal components. And I could do this in exponential form, but it turns out it's easier to do it in Cartesian form. So I'm going to call this beta plus i delta. All right. So we're trying to solve this equation a star dot b equals zero. And that implies that uh, two negative i dotted with our unknown Jones vector equals zero. So let's just evaluate this dot product. It's 2 alpha minus i outside of all this stuff. Of course, it's going to make sense to expand that bracket out and find the real and imaginary parts of this equation. So that's going to give me um, 2 alpha. The real part of the expanded product is going to be uh, plus delta. And the imaginary part is minus i beta. And this thing is all equal to zero. Remember how we did this um, trick when we solved the praxial equation and we said that because we've got linearly independent bits of an equation equaling zero, we can take their coefficients and set them each to zero? The same thing is true with this type of expression. Um, this innocuous looking zero is actually zero plus zero i. And this is actually two equations. The real part is equal to zero and the imaginary part is equal to zero. So we can say that this is equal to zero, and also uh, this is equal to zero. This seems a bit weird. Beta is zero. That's fine. We're still left with one meaningful equation, and that is that um, two alpha plus delta is equal to zero. The weird thing here is that um, it might not look like we've actually solved this vector b, because we're left with uh, some unknown. We've got two variables still. Well, this is just a comment on the uniqueness of orthogonal vectors. When we find um, the vector that's orthogonal to A, we're not finding any one vector. Instead, we're finding a class of vectors. And that class of vectors is stipulated by this equation. 
and we're allowed to choose any one example. Let's choose the example where um, alpha equals one. Uh, then we'll have found that B is equal to uh, one and the only other component is beta. No, beta was zero. It was, oh, I'm sorry. Alpha equals one, delta was on the bottom. So I times delta in this case is uh, negative two I. So this is our Jones vector that's orthogonal to um, two I. And you know, it's, it's worth checking this because it's so easy to do. Let's just check that, um, that conjugate of A dotted with our vector that we found negative two I is equal to zero. That's two uh, plus two I squared, which is of course equal to zero as well. Okay, so yep, we are recovering all the useful precepts of linear algebra here. Um, these Jones vectors make an excellent vector space. We can also ask what these two states look like. This is a little more complicated and uh, you'll get an example of this in the final optics tutorial. Uh, it turns out that two I uh, looks like this and one negative two I looks like this. And actually if you um, think about this, these major axes of these two ellipses are orthogonal, but also the handedness is orthogonal too. So this is a hint, it's not a proof, it's a hint that for some arbitrary elliptical polarization, um, the orthogonal state will have an orthogonal major axis and an opposite handedness. There's a um, detailed proof of this on Moodle, it takes about two pages of complex algebra, it's very character building. <clears throat> Let's check linear combination. So we can also um, uh, find, for example, that we don't have to specify the expansion of a polarization state in terms of the X and Y unit vectors, we can choose a completely different basis. And unlike your studies of real vector spaces, we can even choose a complex basis states. So here I've chosen to represent um, some arbitrary AX, AY, which is typically done in um, the Cartesian coordinates, unit vector X and unit vector Y, and ask myself, what does this look like when the basis is comprised of uh, left-handed circular and right-handed circular? Uh, this is a matter of simple algebra to show that these coefficients are the coefficients of the expansion in a new basis. So we're allowed to change bases and the cool thing about um, Jones vectors is that these new basis vectors can be complex. There's another exercise in the notes that I'll leave to you guys, which is to um, decompose uh, an arbitrary Jones vector into a linear combination of not linear or circular, but instead these um, two elliptical states that we looked at uh, just a moment ago. So now we've um, figured out the, the basics of classifying polarization and putting the state into some abstract vector space. Now let's talk about manipulating it. And the first case, the kind of vanilla case of manipulating polarization is to use a linear polarizer. Uh, these things, um, or these things, which we'll have a look at shortly. The mechanism, I don't want to go too much into the mechanism, but basically we have some medium that is dichroic. And what this means is that, is that it maximally transmits a component of polarization along one direction and it uh, maximally attenuates a um, orthogonal component. And you know, you can have various models for this. In the case of the microwave domain, we have a nice physical model. It's the thing you used in um, the EM1 experiment, which is a polarizer made of these um, parallel conducting rods. They polarize microwaves. In an optical domain, we normally have crystals that give us this matrix structure that does the polarizing for us. Uh, these are much loved by photographers for reducing glare um, and also much loved by, um, by fish. So um, let's figure out what the Jones matrix is for this thing. So we're going to figure out the Jones matrix for the linear polarizer and um, we're going to do it for two cases. One is the horizontal polarizer and one is the vertical polarizer. This will allow us to build uh, the Jones matrix for any arbitrary polarizer. In fact, we only need to do the horizontal case but we'll do the vertical one too. And um, I'm going to ask you to dig deep into your minds and think about Tim Garoni for a bit. Tim Garoni for life, TG4L. And uh, think about how we actually construct matrix representations of operators. We do it by thinking about the action of those operators on the basis states. So I'm going to introduce uh, a new symbol called A. 
horizontal arrow. This is the operator, which is going to represent this horizontal polarizer. What does it do to the basis state 1, 0? A linear polarization along the x direction. Well, of course, it maximally transmits this, this state. So it gives us back 1, 0. Excellent. We then ask, what does this operator do to the other basis state, the vertical polarized state? It maximally attenuates it. It gives us back 0, 0. What do we then do with these two output vectors? How do we make the matrix for, for A horizontal arrow? We just stick them as columns of our new met matrix. Right? So this is super easy to do. By doing that simple bit of mathematics, we now know what the matrix is for this operator. It's 1, 0, 0, 0. That is the, the Jones matrix for a horizontal linear polarizer. Super easy. Let's do the case of um, vertical, a vertically oriented polarizer, denoting it by a familiar symbol again. Again, we think, we think about what this does to horizontal polarization. It completely extinguishes it, so it gives us 0, 0. And a vertical polarizer acting on a vertically polarized state maximally transmits it. Now our job is literally just to paste those vectors into columns of a new matrix. 0, 0, 0, 1. In quantum mechanics, these are called projection operators. They take whatever component you have along the horizontal or vertical directions and return just that, cancelling out everything else. Uh, they are the exact same thing in optics. They take only the horizontal part or only the vertical part of your Jones vector and throw away the rest. Yes? If I'd done that, I would have made a, um, a change of basis. Um, if we're ordering the states like this, then we've naturally already identified the first component as the horizontal component, the second component as the vertical component. If I was to swap the order of these in the matrix, I would have implicitly changed the order of my basis. Basis, uh, bases have an ordering. And the ordering is dictated not just in terms of the column ordering of the matrices, but the actual row ordering of the, of the vectors as well. We've already admitted the ordering by specifying this to be a horizontal polarized state. Great question. So we've done these two very simple cases. Um, for the rest of today, we're going to think about uh, arbitrarily oriented polarizers. And indeed, we're going to derive Malice's law, a familiar um, uh, form of changing the polarization of light. So Hecht has this diagram of um, analyzing polarization using um, lots of complicated stuff. So I look at this diagram and I just think, there's way too much stuff in here that's not physics. Now, don't get me wrong, I like a good artist depiction. But, you know, we're going to cross out all this stuff um, because we're going to assume that the spaghetti monster has already given us pure polarization. We don't need to go through the first step of making some unpure light or impure light polarized. Um, this second thing is called an analyzer. This is just a polarizer. And we're going to think about what the output is when we vary the angle of that polarizer. So we're taking a complicated diagram and making it much simpler. And the simplification reduces this problem to thinking about a, um, a linear polarizer oriented at angle theta. Really simple. So to, to really get a handle on this, we need to um, remember what rotation operators do. And in two dimensions for real vectors, you'll have seen this rotation operator before that takes vectors and rotates them anti-clockwise by an angle theta. Um, we can apply the same rotation operators to Jones vectors, even though they're in a complex vector space. That's totally OK. The rotation operator has the following properties. Uh, it's transverse is the same as rotation by a negated angle, which is the same as the inverse of that rotation operator. Um, this is just telling us that um, this is a well-defined geometric transform with a well-defined inverse. It also is well-defined because it doesn't change the norm of a vector. So uh, in this case, what does that mean? If we have some Jones vector, well, its norm is the uh, dot product of the vector with itself. So whenever we have a Jones vector E tilde, if we want to find its complex norm, we must take uh, E tilde, dot it with E tilde star. And we better have the case that um, this doesn't change the norm of the vector. And because in this case, the norm of the vector is proportional to intensity. And indeed, we find that um, uh, this is a well-defined operation because the norm of this vector is just the quadrature sum of E0x and E0y, all squared. 
So can anyone tell me why rotation shouldn't affect intensity? Yep. Actually, rotation doesn't affect the phase per se. It doesn't affect the phase, that's right. What's your answer? Temporal average. Huh. That's actually quite true, yes. If we weren't taking the temporal average, the rotation would actually affect our answer. Um, but it's also because, uh, in a very abstract sense, intensity is a scalar quantity. It should be invariant under rotations. It doesn't have a handedness or a, a vector nature. So these scalar fields uh, should be invariant under rotations. All right, this is um, my version of hex diagram. We've got some um, Cartesian axes X and Y. And uh, we're going to send in a, a vertically polarized state. So it's got a Jones vector proportional to 0, 1. And we're going to rotate the polarizer so its transmission axis is theta clockwise from the vertical direction. Of course, we know in a pictorial sense what the polarization is going to look like at the output, at least in terms of an arrow. And it's going to have uh, a, an orientation that's parallel to the transmission axis. What we want to know is what the intensity of that arrow is. What's the relative intensity of the output state with respect to the input state? That's Malice's law. Before we do any um, more mathematics, I think it's probably a good, a good time to have a break and play with uh, my smartphone, your sunglasses, and give away some prizes. Has anyone got a pair of uh, polarizing sunglasses they would like to, um, to uh, donate to this demonstration? Yes? Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, two, okay. Well, let's, let's have a polarization off. All right. So um, my phone actually, and probably all of your phones do as well, puts out pretty polarized light. And um, this is a really simple way to demonstrate uh, Malice's law. If I rotate this, I've got complete attenuation of the light. And then I've got almost complete transmission. And it's not perfect because these glasses aren't perfect and my screen isn't perfect. But actually, let's take a look at this one. So think about that attenuation ratio. And here, we're gonna go from um, when, the, when the glasses are pointing upwards like this, I get no light coming through, 90 degrees, I get maximum transmission, and 180, I get complete attenuation. Thanks very much for that, guys. Um, it looks like these ones were the, were the better ones. <laughs> we can make this a little bit more precise by using actual polarizers. And we can also uh, take hex lead on this and use two of them. The first one being to polarize the light. So here's the example repeated with uh, an actual polarizing film. Let's chuck that one there so that the light coming out is uh, as bright as we can get it and polarized. Now when I stick in another polarizer, I'll see complete attenuation. And um, it'll go from to some intensity and then back to zero again. So I want you to, um, to think about the functional form of this transmitted intensity. So it's going to depend on one thing, the angle theta that I rotate the polarizer. Take, as, take this to be zero, so theta equals zero. And I want you to draw for me on a piece of paper or a tablet or a whiteboard what the transmitted intensity looks like as a function of theta. So here's theta equals zero, here's theta equals 90, and here's theta equals 180, or pi. There's two of these up for grabs, which are polarization kits um, for the best or the quickest diagram. Evgeny's finished. That's good. All right, I'll take one more solution, Evgeny. Thank you. And if you can, actually, so uh, if you can write down the functional form as well, that would be great. Any other takers? Yep. Great, thank you very much. Okay, I have two, ta two contenders for the, for the prize of the polarization kit. Uh, here's Evgeny's solution. He's got the intensity starting at some maximum value. At 90 degrees, it goes down to zero. It comes back up to 180. And um, I'm not sure what that squiggle is above the cosine, but I'm going to take that 
charitably, to, to be cosine squared of theta, which is fantastic. Yes. Uh, we also have another contender, which is the same graph. Maximum at zero, minimum at... at oh, I've got no x-axis labels. I'll have to take some stuff out of this one. No, no, that's fine. So it's cosine squared of theta. Thanks very much, guys. Here's your magic struct polarization kit. Okay. Thanks. Other way around. So to show the rest of you what you missed out on, um, here are some things in this kit. I've got two cross polarizers. You've probably seen that demo before. But I've also got a bunch of plastic in here. Uh, I've got a cup. I've got this kind of little um, square uh, vial and a broken fork um, and some broken cup as well. Why have I got these? Well, check this out. When I build a cross, a cross polarizer by doing this, I might have to turn the lights off for this. Let's try it there. What do we see? We see the same colors from the thin film interference of a soap bubble. Isn't that cool? Um, you can't really see it that well from the document camera. I'll try a different angle here. Good idea. That's as bright as it gets. So um, if I get them uh, crossed, what we're actually looking at here is the stress inside the material. So you can use cross polarizers to image the stress. And there are plenty of other examples of how you can do this. You basically need to get any machine plastic and put it in here. And you'll be able to see for different angles, uh, different colors of the, um, of the stress. Uh, to come down up to class, if you um, can't see this clearly, and you can really see this beautiful thin film interference, which um, has the same color, color scheme as we saw for soap bubbles, um, but not rainbows. Awesome. All right. So we need to take some input state theta to re reproduce this result of the output intensity equals to cosine squared theta. And we need to um, find out what the Jones, vector for, Jones matrix for this thing is. Except we don't know that a priori. What we do know, however, is the Jones matrix for a vertically oriented uh, polarizer. So all we need to do, actually, in this diagram is to um, change our coordinate system to these new coordinates x prime and y prime. If we were living in that coordinate system, if we'd expressed our Jones vector in that coordinate system, we could readily write down the Jones matrix for this rotated polarizer. And I want you to think about what that actually entails. So this is what that diagram looks like in a plane with Z coming out towards us. Our input state is along the y-axis, and we need to find out what the Jones vector is in the rotated coordinates. So how do we do this? You tell me. We can do one of these four things. There's only one right answer here. The coordinate system is the background of this slide. I expect this one will be a bit closer. You guys are a clever bunch. This is always quite tricky. In fact, if you've come to the tutorial already, you'll know that the only way I can figure this out is by looking at a test vector. And I was really encouraged by some of you doing this uh, by yourselves, taking a test vector and seeing, if, seeing which one of these was correct. Indeed, we do need to rotate the Jones vector in xy coordinates are anti-clockwise by theta, when we want to express it in a coordinate system that's clockwise from theta uh, with respect to the original coordinates. That's a mouthful. You need to test it with unit vectors to make sense of it for yourself. But um, I haven't stumped you yet, and I, I remain uh, defeated in all of these because you've got the right answer again. Well done. So we can now check. Let's check for this case of a, um, a Jones vector when we're trying to rotate it. So our job is to find uh, E in xy, x prime, y prime coords. 
actually you can see from this test case that we already kind of know the answer here from just geometry. The y component, the y prime component is going to be positive and it will be sine of theta. The x prime component, which you'll hopefully be able to see by taking a projection along the x prime axis, is actually negative. So if I drew the component along x prime, that's a negative component. So that's negative cosine of theta. In fact, I've got these the wrong way around. That should be negative sine theta and cos theta. Okay, this hasn't told me whether it's a clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation yet, um, but you'll be able to see that if I actually act on this with the correct rotation matrix, it works out to be um, R of theta dotted with E in XY coordinates. Because that matrix is cosine of theta, negative sine of theta, sine of theta, cos of theta. When I act on that with, um, on that 0, 1 vector, I get out what I've written from inspection, which is negative sine theta, cos of theta. Cool. Now we know that the um, Jones vector, Jones matrix for the vertically oriented polarizer in X prime, Y prime coordinates is uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. When we act on that Jones vector in 